So in this video, we will talk a little bit about the exposure triangle. In a nutshell, the exposure triangle are three parameters which allow any camera, whether it's your cell phone or a professional DSLR, to take in the light and turn light into an image. So here's what we mean by the exposure triangle. We have the three main elements, the shutter speed, the ISO, and the aperture. And we will talk about what these parameters, these settings do in the coming slides. So let's start with the aperture. The aperture in a nutshell is the size of your camera's pupil. It will control how much light passes through. The aperture will impact the depth of field, which means how much of your image can be in focus. And know that a one step difference means a twofold light difference. So if you go from 1.4 to 2, you're losing light. And if we look at the diagram, on the left we have f1.4, that's what we will call a wide aperture. And at the other end of the spectrum, we have f8, which is a much smaller aperture. So if you compare this to your pupil, you can understand that a wide or large aper aperture will allow in more light, whereas f8, a smaller aperture, will let less light pass through. And this is just an example because we can go down all the way to f22, even f32. It really depends on the quality of your lens, how many blades it has and, and whatnot. But you don't need to remember all of that by heart. Just remember that f1.4 is a wide aperture, whereas f8 in this case is a much smaller or narrower aperture. The shutter speed is another parameter that you can control. It will control the amount of time your shutter is open for. On older cameras, or if you look at a DSLR, you can actually see curtains inside. There are mechanical curtains. Cell phones or mirrorless cameras will use an electronic system to control the shutter speed, but the concept is the same. You are controlling the exposure time. Controlling the shutter speed can help you blur or freeze a scene. We'll talk some more about that in the coming slides. Our third parameter is the ISO. That's the sensitivity of your film, if you're still using a 35 millimeter camera, for instance, or the sensitivity of your captor when using a digital camera or a cell phone. ISO 50 is less sensitive to light, whereas something like ISO 3200 will be much more sensitive to light, but there is a trade-off. The higher you go, the more sensitive your captor will be, but the more grain you will see in your image. So if you take a long exposure photo at night, say with an ISO 50 or 100, your photo will look less grainy, grainier than a photo taken at night with an ISO of 3200. Again, keep that in mind. There is always a trade-off and that's how the exposure triangle works. If you modify one of the three parameters, you will need to modify another one accordingly. So if you use a less sensitive ISO, you will either need to slow down your exposure time. So you will need to look at the scene longer, let in more light over a longer period of time, and or you will need to use a wider aperture so that more light can come through no matter how long you are exposing your captor for. Here's a good example of the exposure triangle at work. That's a uh, photo I took early in the morning in a campground. You can actually see some cars in the background. So it's not like a photo really worth publishing or anything, but I, I feel that it's a good example because you can really see the rays of light coming between uh, coming in between the, the trees and uh, to do that I had to play around with my settings so we have an aperture of f 5.6 which isn't a super wide aperture it's not super narrow either so it's kind of an in-between I used a very slow shutter speed one sixth of a second which if I recall correctly uh, meant that I had to use a tripod or I think it was this fence that I put the camera on. Anyway, know that at one sixth of a second, 
Um, if you want your image to be sharp and not blurry, you will need to stabilize your camera. And I had an ISO of 400, so the photo is a little bit grainy, but not too much, it's acceptable. And by cropping the cars out, though, so if I were to crop the left portion of the photo, I could technically print that or it'd be Instagram worthy because we really see the light coming in uh, in between the trees. Here are a few examples. And the photo in the, in the background is a good example. Uh, that's Hogs Back in Ottawa. And you can actually see water droplets if you look closely. Well, it means that I used a rather fast shutter speed because I froze the water droplets as they were moving. Had I used a slower shutter speed, the water would have this kind of veil effect. But now the water is very sharp, which means that I used a rather fast shutter speed. Here is a good example of a small aperture. That's Teotihuacan. It's a, a site northeast of Mexico City, Mexico. So I visited the site. We have the Pyramid of the Sun in the left um, corner of the image. And then I, we have the main uh, street. And you can actually see pretty much everything in focus. To do that, I used an aperture of f8, which isn't a super small aperture, but it was good enough for what I needed. I wanted a good depth of field. And there is another thing that will influence your depth of field, uh, and that is the um, uh, focal length of your lens. In this case, I used a rather wide angle lens combined with a smaller aperture. Therefore, my photo is pretty deep uh, deep when it comes to the uh, depth of field. My speed, 1 200th of a second. So that was handheld, no need to stabilize the camera, it's fast enough. And ISO 100, a very slow ISO, not too, too sensitive to light. Um, but the good thing is that I did not need a sensitive ISO because that was in broad daylight and my photo isn't too grainy. Granted, if you look at the back, you will see that the mountains look a little bit blurry. And that beca that's because um, there was some fog or some uh, clouds because we were high up in the mountains. Here is a counter example using a large aperture. So my depth of field isn't as deep. If we were to zoom in, we could actually read what's written on the first turbine that's in a dam, uh, but you wouldn't be able to read what's written on the second turbine and the turbines behind that one. And again, I used a rather wide angle here, so we still have a good depth of field, but because my aperture was rather large in order to let in more light, because it was a rather dark scene, you know, I had to make a trade-off. And in this case, I had to trade depth of field for more light. The aperture was 3.5, speed of 1 80th of a second, we're starting to be, um, it, it's starting to be very slow here. It works with a wide angle, but don't use that speed with a longer focal length. Say if you were to use a telephoto or a zoom lens, that would be way too slow. ISO 800, so the photo isn't too, too grainy, but we're starting to see some grain. And there is also kind of a weird color distraction if you look uh, carefully at the uh, red top on the first turbine. That's because there was a glass. I was actually shooting through a, a window. Therefore, the photo isn't quite perfect, but it does the trick. I just wanted to, to show the inside of the hydro dam. Prague, Czech Republic. That's a nighttime photo. Interestingly, I had visited Prague in 2015, took a photo from that very uh, spot it's um, on a bridge and you can climb up a tower. And I didn't really like the result. And a few years later, I went back to Prague with my wife. So I went back to the exact same spot and tried to take the photo again. And that was the end result. Is it a perfect photo? No, there are a few things I do differently, but I kind of like it. It's a nice travel shot. The uh, castle in the top right corner is well lit. So are the people on the bridge in the lower left corner. And in order to take this photo, I used a somewhat slow shutter speed. So my aperture again, f8. So I have a good depth of field. You can actually see the buildings in the foreground and the buildings in the background. They're all in focus. 
My speed was 2.5 seconds, so the photo was taken over a 2.5 second time frame, which means that I had to stabilize the camera with a tripod, or in this case, I just rested the camera on a ledge, and I used an ISO of 100, therefore the photo isn't too, too grainy. There is a little bit of grain if you look carefully in the sky, uh, but that's not because of the ISO, that's because I enhanced the photo a little bit in post-production, and there is a trade-off when you do that, especially in low-light situations. Your photo can end up being a bit grainier, and there is also the matter of compression. Since this is a PowerPoint presentation, the photos were heavily compressed. Therefore, the photo looks a little bit grainier than it actually does on my computer monitor. We have a good example here of a fast shutter speed. Two planes, that was a photo I took during Remembrance Day a while back. Two planes over Parliament Hill. They were quite high in the sky, zooming by. So I used a long lens, a zoom lens, with an aperture of nine. Maybe my aperture was a bit too small, but I wanted to make sure that I had plenty of room when it came to the um, focus, like the, the focal length combined with the speed. I wanted to have a rather large depth of field so that no matter uh, whether my camera was um, going to focus automatically on the first or the second plane, I'd have a sharp-ish photo. I used a speed of one uh, five hundredth of a second and an ISO of 400. Maybe I should have used a slightly wider aperture and a slightly faster shutter speed and the photo might have been a bit sharper, but it's still pretty sharp. Again, it is compressed, but you can actually read Y2 on the first plane and then AU on the um, other plane and they were pretty high in the sky and moving at a speed of a plane. You can actually see that the propellers are um, a bit blurry, but you can still see the different elements in the propellers. Uh, therefore, it means that my shutter speed really froze the action. The Colosseum in Rome in a low light situation. In this case, I used a low ISO, so ISO 100 with a, an aperture of f22, so very, very small aperture and a speed of over two minutes. I overdid it in this case. I could have used an aperture of you know, F8 and a much slower uh, or much faster speed rather, and it would have done the trick, but I was playing around with my camera, wanted to experiment, and you see that the photo isn't really grainy. If you look in the top left corner, the sky is pretty dark and the blacks are pretty black. Therefore, it worked. You have some light trails in the foreground, and um, that was um, the light trails were created by cars driving by because I took my photo over a two minute uh, time frame. A counter example we have a low light situation once again, but this time with a very high ISO. ISO 1600, which isn't that high with modern cameras. I took this over a decade ago with a much older camera. Therefore, 1600 was kind of pushing it, and you see that the photo is a bit blurry. There is lots of grain in there. One sixth of a second. Again, I had to stabilize it, uh, stabilize the camera on a tripod, but even then, the photo looks a little bit blurry, and that's not because it wasn't in focus. It's because my ISO was so high that the photo ended up being very grainy. So you have to be careful with that. So to recap, a small aperture means that less light will pass through, but it will lead to a deeper depth of field. A large aperture will let in more light, but you will generally end up with a shallower depth of field. A slow shutter speed will help you blur movements. It can create light trails. A fast shutter speed will help you freeze movements. It will also work well with a telephoto lens. So if you're using a long zoom lens, make sure to use a fast shutter speed, otherwise your photo will likely be blurry. A low ISO means that your sensor will let in less light because it is less sensitive, but it will also give you less grain, generally speaking. Again, in post, when you do post-production, you can also add grain by playing with your uh, sliders a bit too much. We'll see that later. A high ISO means that your sensor is more sensitive to light, 
but your image will generally be grainier. Here are some other tips and tricks. You can create a shallow depth of field by moving very close to an object and focusing on it and combining that with a wide aperture. So here we have my friend Darren in the desert and I wanted him to be out of focus, kind of in the background, and I wanted to focus on this sign which said extreme difficulty. So it worked and it's a, a cool photo. Here we have Teotihuacan, Mexico once again, and this photo demonstrates lens compression. So the people in the foreground are hundreds of meters from the pyramid of the moon, which is in the background, but they look quite close to it. And that's because I was quite far back and used a long lens. Therefore, I compressed the foreground and the background together, and it created this nice, interesting photo. And you see that it was a rather gray, um, it was very gray outside that day. So the colors aren't the best, but you know, I was there as a tourist. So I took the best photos I could given the weather. The sun was pretty harsh though. You can use a flash outdoors. Here we have my wife, Samantha in the Netherlands. We were in Amsterdam and there was this culture you could sit in. I took this photo as a test. So. It's not the best composition. I was just playing around with the light and you know, we can see her, but it, it's, it's not that great. So I had one flash with me. I didn't bring an entire studio. I had one flash to work with. So of course the result isn't perfect, but as a travel photo, as a souvenir, it's much nicer. I simply put a flash on the right and you can tell that the flash was on the right because there is a shadow on her nose. The composition is a little bit better. We don't have people right behind her and it works. Is it the best result possible? No, I had one flash, but it did the trick. And keep that in mind, you know, especially as journalists, you will always aim to do a perfect job, but there is often a trade-off. In this case, I couldn't bring a lot of equipment with me. I had one flash and it did the trick. This is a good enough, you know, a photo, the, the photo is good enough um, for my needs. Be careful in low light situations. We have Craig uh, Kilberger here, founder of We. That was at a conference years ago, and that was a low light situation. So dark background, low light. There was one spot on him, and what happened? Well, you can actually see that his face is a little bit overexposed, and that's because your camera, um, if you use your camera on the automatic mode, will the camera will measure the overall light in a scene and will try to average it. In this case, the scene was quite dark. So the camera overexposed everything, but he was properly exposed. So instead, just underexpose the photo a little bit. It looks much nicer. You really need to watch your highlights. We have a counter example, snow, sand, water, reflect a lot of light. So if you use your camera on the automatic mode, or if you use a cell phone, which generally will be in automatic mode, unless you download an app allowing you to control your exposure, or if you have an iPhone, you can actually control the exposure using the exposure compensation slider. Well, your, your camera will look at the scene and will be like, whoa, there is way too much light here. So your camera will underexpose the scene and your snow will look grayer, people will look underexposed. So you need to compensate the exposure by bringing it up. And in this case, I think I compensated the exposure by about 0.7 stop. You don't need to remember by heart what stops are, but know that when we meet a, when you hear a stop in photography, we're referring to the exposure. So that's pretty much it for the nuts and bolts of the exposure triangle. Now it's your turn to try it out. And we have a lovely photo here of my friend Darren again in Monument Valley. And that's at a, a spot called Forrest Gump Point. So if you've seen Forrest Gump, when he runs across the United States, there is this scene in Monument Valley. That's where it was uh, shot. So it's called Forrest Gump Point. And we have a good example here of a, a deep, depth of field. He's pretty sharp in the foreground and you can see 
the monuments in the background, which are also very sharp.